Okay, this is the third video in the series on cycling of important nutrients. In this video, we're going to look at the phosphorus cycle. And phosphorus is important in living things, just as the nitrogen and the carbon were. The role of phosphorus in the environment is that it's part of the energy-carrying molecule ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. Uh, we mentioned this in an earlier video uh, when when plants do photosynthesis, they basically take carbon dioxide and water plus sunlight and basically they're converting the sun's energy into chemical energy in the form of glucose and oxygen, which of course other living things can use. And what do they use it for? Well, they use it for, this is photosynthesis, they use it for cellular respiration. So they take uh, glucose that they ingest. Uh, plants also use the glucose that they make in this way. And they burn it in the presence of oxygen. And from that they get carbon dioxide and water and energy, which is in the form of ATP or chemical energy. So we've seen this before. Basically these two reactions are the reverse of each other. In photosynthesis carbon dioxide and water plus energy give you glucose and oxygen and what's happening here is that the energy from the sunlight is being locked in the bonds of the glucose. Then living things when they need energy they want to take the energy out of the bonds of glucose and for that they do cellular respiration. They convert it into a much more usable form ATP which is sort of a smaller unit of energy because glucose is holding a lot of energy. Each ATP molecule, and there are about 36 of them made by this process, each ATP is con holding considerably less energy. But that's okay because this is the amount that a cell can use at a time. The amount in glucose is just too much. Anyway, that explains a little bit about why ATP is essential to life. And you've probably already figured out because I've said this, that the P stands for phosphate. So this is adenosine triphosphate. So there's the phosphate. And of course a phosphate group is PO4. Okay, so the role of phosphorus in plants is that it promotes root growth, stem strength, and seed production. And so there's no mistake that uh, we actually include phosphate when we make fertilizers for plants. So that's one of the main components. In humans, phosphate is important for strong bones because our bones, as you know, are made up of calcium, but the calcium is actually bond to phosphate. Okay, so our bones are actually made of calcium phosphate. In nature, uh, phosphates or phosphorus is trapped in rocks and sediments and in oceans as PO4 phosphate, uh, HPO4 and H2PO4, oh sorry, H2PO4 minus. Um, it's not stored in the atmosphere so we don't have um, phosphate gas or phosphorus gas or anything like that the way we have nitrogen gas and the way we have carbon uh, dioxide gas. So it's released because it's mainly locked up in uh, rocks and sediments. It's released by weathering, uh, acid precipitation, or by lichens, which are that symbiotic relationship between the fungus and the algae. All three of those things, the weathering, the acid rain, and the lichens, they all work to break down rock. And if they can break down rock, that's going to release some of these phosphorus-containing compounds into the environment and that's when it gets absorbed by uh, plants. Okay, and if the plants have the phosphorus, then the grazing and predatory animals that uh, you know feed in the food chain and ultimately um, consume anything that the plants have produced, uh, they're going to get the organic phosphate as well. When they die, of course, that phosphate is going to go back to the environment and it's going to become part of the sediments. And those sediments, again, eventually become rock and have to wait for weathering or acid rain or lichens to break it down again. So it's a fairly simple cycle. Humans influence the phosphorus cycle. They add excess phosphorus through mining and through fertilizer uh, components. Okay, and 
the slash and burning of forests actually removes phosphorus from the trees it's no longer located in the organic matter and the living things and it gets deposited in waterways as ash and that's a problem because then again it becomes part of the sediments and will eventually turn to rock and that's going to lock it up. This is a great big phosphorus sink. Okay so in all three of our cycles that we've looked at uh, hopefully the message that you got is that they are very delicate balances. The cycles cause the material to move through the ecosystem and therefore through living things. And if we tip the balance by adding extra um, components or by removing them or forcing them to sort of get stuck in a sink, that's going to affect the ecosystems and that means the living things and that also means the biodiversity. So for example if we look back at carbon Okay, increased carbon in the biosphere actually affects climate change and you guys all know this that extra carbon dioxide actually changes uh, patterns in the climate. You see changes in rainfall, temperature and wind patterns and that seriously affects the amount of biodiversity. The amount of different types of species actually can cause extinctions, uh, can cause reductions in a population and then if it's a keystone species uh, like a really important species in that particular ecosystem it can actually affect other species as well so for example if we have temperature changes in, so for example in our region if we have temperature changes an organism like sockeye salmon uh, just can't swim uh, because the water is too warm and it dies and this results in a reduced salmon population and it doesn't just affect the salmon because then you have less food for bears and eagles and more smaller water organisms that would have been eaten by the salmon actually explode in population so it really does tip the balance. Uh, if we look at the nitrogen cycle again, excess nitrogen aff affects plant biodiversity. Certain species like grass really tolerate excess nitrogen and they'll grow like crazy. And it's one of the reasons we put fertilizer on our grass. But what we do then is tip the balance because the grass outperforms and outcompetes other plants like little tree seedlings. And you know, in nature, maybe not just on our front lawn, if we're putting a lot of nitrogen on the, the crop plants, uh, we're actually making the crop plants, which are grasses, the grains uh, like wheat and barley and oats, we're actually making them grow a whole lot better, but we're actually preventing trees from growing and trees actually do a really good job of uh, recycling carbon dioxide out of the environment. Um, the other example, the phosphorus cycle, uh, can also be tipped by humans and if we put excess phosphorus into the environment through fertilizing or mining, uh, this can cause, cause problems as well. Also excess phosphorus uh, can be caused by introduced non-native plants and either way it results in reduced algae production in some lakes in Ontario and the lack of algae results in less food for herbivores and less of them all around, reduced numbers and therefore that affects other consumers in the food chain. So uh, just by tipping the balance of any of these three cycles we can actually very adversely affect the ecosystem and the amount of variation of life and the biodiversity and as we learned earlier biodiversity is really critical uh, for maintaining a balance in our environment a lot more important than than might at first appear. Okay so that concludes uh, the third video on cycling of nutrients in the environment.